In order to live an extraordinary and abundant life, you must focus on your internal battle and win within. My name is Randy Wilson, and welcome to the Rich Mind Podcast. All right, everyone, welcome back to the Rich Mind Podcast. And today, excited. Uh, this is going to be a fun conversation. This is actually going to be a returning guest. Uh, just two or three episodes ago. This wasn't very long ago that this episode dropped originally with Gary Pinkerton. We're going to dive a little bit deeper into the family banking concepts. Uh, and I'm super excited to get into, let's call it the weeds, you know, get a little deeper into the conversation, learn about how we can build wealth. How can we build a legacy for our families moving forward? Uh, we're not going to get into a lot of the bio things today. I would refer you back to that first episode if you want to learn more about Gary's story and how it's impacted uh, where he is today. Uh, it resonates very similar to mine, as you may or may not, may not know with mine, right? I lost my father. Uh, it's been actually 10 years ago. I was just thinking about that before we hit record today. Uh, we're coming up on the 10 year anniversary of losing my father and he didn't have anything necessarily set up for my brother and myself and for our family, which is unfortunate. But at the same time, it sent me down a rabbit trail of learning exactly what we're going to be discussing about today and how you can implement these tools in your life. They're not difficult. They're a little bit different, meaning it, it might take a little bit of uh, some different thinking to comprehend them. But at the same time, once you get the concepts, once you get the ideas and start the implementation process, I'm telling you, it, it's an exciting thing. You start to take control and you start to see some things uh, showing up different in your life from a financial, from a wealth, from a legacy standpoint. And I'm super excited to get into that. So Gary, Without further ado, man, appreciate you coming back on. That's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, that's awesome. I look forward to it. We had great feedback from one of my clients when I reran the podcast on on mine. And uh, it was just amazing, uh, you know, reflecting on what he said he is doing with his sons, uh, you know, and their, their teenagers, um, young, becoming the oldest is becoming a young adult. And, and the stuff that, that he is doing because of our messages, I mean, it's really heartwarming to realize that you're actually making a difference. You know, you never really know podcasting, right? Like, is anybody listening? You know, so yes. I, I'm always asking my uh, my people, please provide feedback. Uh, and and they like uh, most of all when when I'm on uh, somebody else's podcast or when somebody's on my podcast, so that there's a bit of a dialogue there. Uh, you know, my ego would like them to just want to listen to me. <laughs> it doesn't always work out that way. So I really appreciate uh, again being on with you again, and uh, let's go. Yes, it's going to be a lot of fun. And we appreciate that feedback. Uh, as you mentioned, yeah, there's a lot of times, right? I'm, I'm hitting record here in my little room and looking into the camera or having a conversation just like this. You're just wondering, is it is it landing out there in, in the audience? And uh, yeah. to get feedback like that is much appreciated. So uh, to that gentleman that sent that feedback, uh, much appreciated. If you're listening again, thanks for joining us. Uh, at the same time, yeah, super excited to dive a little bit deeper and get into the to the nitty gritty as far as what this family banking thing is. You mentioned that in the previous episode that this is a a vehicle that can be used uh, to really help accelerate and help you as far as building some wealth and leaving that lasting legacy for your family moving forward. So I'm super excited to dig into that conversation. Uh, before I get into it, into it too far, folks, I wanted to uh, encourage you, if you're listening to this on audio only, once again, we appreciate you being here, but Gary's going to be sharing some slides and some information on that if you were to watch this on video might be more beneficial for you. We'll do the best that we can. And Gary will do the best that he can to describe what's on the screen uh, to you from a audio standpoint. So that way you can comprehend what's being discussed. But if you want to catch this, uh, we'll be on YouTube to watch the video. And then also Spotify has videos as well. So I just want to put that out there as a kind of a little bit disclaimer here at the very beginning that if you're uh, really want to get in and really comprehend what's going on, I highly recommend to catch this on video today. So Let's jump in, man. Uh, where do you want to start? Let's uh, let's dive a little, little bit deeper. Like the last episode, we were kind of at that thirty thousand foot view, and uh, yeah, where do you want to take us today? Well, I thought that um, just talking kind of big picture of an example of what a size might look like, and then taking a few minutes to, uh, well, first of all, it's not just the size; it, it is also um, you know the features you put on it um, that that will enable it. Uh, that takes something that was meant to be pure life insurance, permanent death benefit protection and turn it into a personal banking system. And maybe also just go over, why are we even doing that? Um, and then after a kind of a quick example for those that can watch the video, then uh, I thought maybe let's talk about how it applies to different kind of age ranges, because this is a tool that um, 
will work with you if you understand it. It'll work with you throughout your entire life. And clearly it'll work through generations because, you know, when you're in your 30s, it has application. And then when you're in your 50s, you have kids in their 30s, maybe. Uh, and then when you're in your 80s, you've got it's still working for you and your kids in their 50s and your grandkids in their 20s or 30s. So it will work throughout all age groups, all ages, and it just gets better with time, kind of like a fine wine. So, uh, but you have to understand what it's for. I have clients who started this because somebody told them that it was a, a really good way to fund real estate property down payments. And I, I actually, I had a client recently who just up and canceled his policy when it was like performing at its very best. And I'm like, hey, what happened? And and he's like, oh, well, uh, nothing happened. I'm just, I, I, I loved having it, but I'm no longer buying properties. I'm just going to hold the ones I have. And so like, he totally misunderstood. And I didn't get across, shame on me, that this isn't just about, you know, a cool tool to be used to, to uh, fund rental properties or some other investment. So we'll try to talk about more uh, holistically from a 30,000 foot view and then bring it down to different kinds of examples about how it can be used. But fundamentally, you know, you talked about how it can be a complex thing. I um, love what Robert Kiyosaki taught me one time when we were on a cruise ship together. He, he said uh, that it, you don't really understand something until you can teach it at the eighth grade level. I mean, he might have said the eight year old level. I forget which. But um, but at a very simplistic level, like you don't understand something unless you can bring it down to a grade schooler and they can understand it. And that was uh, mind blowing for me. And I've, I've learned that, I mean, I've watched that happen throughout my career. When I was on, on nuclear submarines, I mean, that can be a complex subject. Um, but the person who is the super expert at it, he's been teaching it for 25 years. You know, they're the guy who can say, no, no, stop. Stop talking about all those details. That's not what's important. What's important is the big picture, right? And so I'm the guy who will talk about this personal family banking system as a bucket. That's that, you know, and, and I have people who in the industry have told me, Man, what are you talking about? You need to be talking about it as a Swiss Army Knight. It's got 17 different features, right? And But what you do is you cause complexity, and it sounds like a, a used car salesman sales pitch. Um, and can it do all the things those guys are saying? Sure, it can. Uh, but it it causes people to lock up in complexity, and they just won't move forward. And, and so now you've not been able to help somebody uh, where it could definitely have helped them. So I'm going to go back to the basics. This, in the end, is a bucket. And and in your life, you're going to want to store uh, currency. You're going to want to store things that you can trade for food and shelter and, you know, these other and, and investments and your retirement. You're going to want to sh- store wealth um, that is fairly liquid and you want to put it in a bucket where it's safe and protected and grows the most reasonable uh, way that it can in that environment. And so there's a you know, there's a few different things that meet this safe, liquid, guaranteed, foundational, emergency fund kind of a bucket. Uh, thankfully, today, the last hundred years, you've been able to put it into a checking account or a savings account. That wasn't always true back, you know, before in the early 1900s. It really was not true. And actually, that is what caused the life insurance industry to be more successful and be around longer than the U.S. banking industry. So if you go back into the 1800s, people who had to have cash available in their business um, to open this, open the doors and exchange it with, uh, you know, with their customers, they had to store it in the banks because they had to have ready access to it frequently. And at the end of the day, they needed to put it somewhere where it was safe. So most of them didn't have safes in their in their businesses, and they and it wouldn't have been a a, a secure environment anyway. So they would give it to the banker, right? If you remember the old store, or the old movie, uh, "It's a Wonderful Life," that one that you know uh, comes around during Christmas time. Uh, well, the, the guy who was running the bank uh, had to have cash, but he couldn't store it in the bank, ironically. Um, uh, so, well, not, let me back up. The business owners that would come in every morning and go go home every day would put small amounts of cash in there, but not their entire life savings, right? The life savings was stored somewhere that was safer than the bank because the bank runs would happen all the time. And why, why would a bank run happen? Well, thankfully, you know, not thankfully, sadly, uh, Great Britain, um, 100 years before America was born, decided that they could uh, hold people's money and gold safe to, to keep it safe. But then they could lend it out to a couple of different people and they would print these IOUs, right, called called currency created by the banks. And that's what this uh, fractional reserve banking thing is. Well, what that resulted in is people would get scared about some some rumor about the bank or some truth about the bank being not so not too solvent. And people would show up and they'd all want their money. Well, the problem is they didn't have as much money as they'd lent out. 
And so they couldn't actually give it back to them. So that's what a bank run is called. And those were happening like every five or 10 years in America in the 1800s and in the early 1900s. And so we created this thing called the Federal Reserve, which, you know, there's a lot of bad things about that. But one of the good things is that they get the ability to print money. And so they can just anoint a bank like they did um, Silicon Valley Bank not too long ago. And they did a lot of banks in the in the Great Recession, our Great Depression. Um, they said, hey, you're too big to fail. And we're going to, you know, print some money and bail you out. Right. And so the people were they, they had this confidence that are made whole. Right. This thing called FDIC insurance. Is that really an insurance policy? Not really. It's just a promise that if we like your bank, we will, you know, um, print money for them to stay solvent or we'll print money for you uh, and hand it to you. Right. So like the money doesn't exist, but they'll print it. And we have confidence in that. And so the bank runs really have stopped happening predominantly. But back in the day, people didn't store their money in banks. They stored their family's wealth in whole life insurance because these mutual whole life insurance companies have this history that goes back to 18, mid 1850s, 1840s maybe, where they have kept their promises. The money is safe, liquid, and guaranteed to always be there. And they back that promise up with um, high ratings from multiple agencies every year in their, of their existence. They, they've gone through things like the Civil War, the Great Depression, the Great Recession that we think was so horrible. But if you go back to the Great Depression, you know, like, um, you know, I, I like what Ronald Reagan said. He, he said that a, a recession is when your neighbor um, loses his job. A depression is when you lose your job. And then a recovery is when Jimmy Carter loses his. <laughs> that was his way of kind of stabbing the other side. But but aside from that last little stab, uh, you know, depression, like that's true. Like almost everyone lost their jobs. Most of the banks failed in America. But these insurance companies kept paying out dividends and profits and keeping their promises. And so their history goes way back. Why is that? Why are they so much safer? Are they just smarter than the banks? No, actually, they're not. There's two big reasons, especially mutual whole life insurance com uh, companies. So the, the first big reason is that they can't do fractional reserve lending. Like they can only lend out to you or to some real estate developer to build a high rise or, or whatever. Like basically, if you don't borrow against the money in your account, then the insurance company is going to lend it out to somebody else that is a reputable borrower that they've lent to for decades that will pay them back. They have near zero default rates on their loans. A bank will go out and lend to a guy to start a pizza joint on the corner right next to somebody else's pizza joint, right? Like that is super risky and the bank will do that and they could just get to write it off and the Fed bails them out, et cetera, et cetera, right? But the insurance companies don't do that and can't do that. And their liability is super long. So like, hopefully you and I, they're not going to pay our families for decades. So, uh, so as the result of that is that they go put the money to work for long periods of time, and that pushes them into investments that are less risky. So I lend money to somebody to flip a house. Like he might get it wrong. The market might turn. He's trying to catch a falling knife and we don't get all our money back. But it's very, um, it's very uncommon that John Deere, Caterpillar, General Electric, Pulte Homes, that they actually, no kidding, go completely out of business and don't uh, pay their creditors. And even if they don't pay their creditors, what do those guys have that the that the insurance company can go get? Well, they have equipment, they have buildings, they have land, right? So they have hard assets. And so the insurance companies are investing in hard assets. I, I get asked frequently, um, since I'm on a tangent, I'll stay there. Um, I get asked frequently, uh, well, what happens if the currency shifts? Well, John Deere is not going to be able to pay back Mass Mutual in greenbacks. He's going to have to use the redbacks or the beads or crypto or wh whatever we're using at the time. But the bottom line is John Deere has assets that the insurance company is protected by, right? And so that's that's why these big companies have lasted for a very long time. They can't do fractional reserve lending. They they have customers that are a very long vision and customers that have historically paid them back um, over time. And they're insuring something that is measurable. Like human life is plus or minus, you know, 70 to 90, maybe 100 and, and the longer you live, the better it is for the insurance company and for you because you're in there partnering together to put the money to work and grow it. So uh, they have a good business model, I guess is what I'm trying to say. It's a long-term perspective. And the second important thing is that they are a mutual company. So what mutual means is that um, they don't have shareholders. So the whole kind of pump the stock share uh, or the shares up um, to make your, your shareholders happy uh, at the board meeting is not good for business quite frequently or quite quite often. So if the insurance company says, well, 
we could invest in this alt crypto, bump the share price by next quarter and be, you know, get bonuses from our board members and from the shareholders. And they'll buy a bunch of shares. It runs our stock price up and then we can dump everything and run and, and retire, right? Like you have two bosses in that case, if you're an insurance company, you have like MetLife has two bosses. Prudential has two bosses. They have the guy that they're trying to not get fired from, uh, who is the guy they're giving all the profits to. And then they have the policyholders. And making short-term decisions is very, very valuable for people with public companies. Uh, making long-term decisions is valuable for the policyholder and it's valuable for people who their only customer is the policy holder. And so a participating mutual insurance company like Mass Mutual, New York Life, Penn Mutual, they, uh, they have one customer and that customer wants them to look long-term. Like we're either saying, listen, I want you to be in business when I die at 120, or I want you to be in business when my kids die at 120 or my grandkids. Like we're looking for these 200 year old companies to be 500 years old. And, and that does not, um, you're not, you're not successful in that environment with a short term intel. How are we doing so far on that part? Fantastic. So the thoughts that's coming to my mind is maybe just going in a little bit and just the comprehension of the difference between term insurance yeah. and then you were talking about whole life, right? Yeah. I think maybe sometimes when I first discovered this, I didn't even realize that was even a th like a difference, right? You're describing the, the benefits and the difference of the whole life. Yeah. But folks have some term insurance, but the understanding what the difference is, right? You're yeah. talking about long term. Uh, and I get it. Sometimes term can also be, you know, relatively long term as well. But we're talking like, like you said, hundred years old up to one hundred and twenty, yeah. which is, I mean, that's like almost incomprehensible as far as like that that far out, right? So maybe just go in a little bit more detail as far as the differences between and why it's and why they are different with the term insurance, which I think was what most folks are accustomed to, and then why this vehicle of the whole life is uh, so much different than that. Yeah. So those of you who are watching video, you're seeing me look down at another screen. I was just going to pull up a quick little visual for that. Um, so this is a mass mutual policy that um, that I, I put together for a client. So here's a quick story. So this, uh, my client gets a, a infinite banking, if you want to call it, or family banking, whole life insurance policy focused on the cash value, not so much the life insurance death benefit, using it as a bank. And then her husband or uh, domestic partner, I'm not sure. Anyway, her, her, we'll call it spouse. Um, he, uh, she said, Hey, he would like to talk with you, but you got to understand something. He hates whole life insurance with a passion. He's a big Dave Ramsey fan. Um, he had his reasons, but he's, she was like, he, I would like you to get a term insurance policy on him. I would feel much better if he had term insurance. Um, cause he has no insurance right now. And so, well, what is the difference? Well, I'm going to get to that in just a second. Uh, but, but the, the point is that I, uh, he came, we had a conversation and he said, listen, Gary, I'm going to live to age 110. I'm super healthy. I'm a health nut. Um, I have long genes in my family. We're going, I'm going to make it. I have no question about that. What I need is for you to put a term insurance policy in place that I will, uh, I will still have it when I die because, you know, my spouse that you know, and yours, your client, she wants me to have a legacy. So I was not even, I hadn't even been in the industry long enough to know that I couldn't do that. I didn't know it was impossible. <laughs> Um, and so I went looking and I found mass mutual mass mutual showed me a life insurance policy with, you know, the values of what it costs every year. And it was one of those level premium term policies. So, uh, I took all the numbers and I graphed them on, uh, and just put them on a graph. Cause I just wanted to be able to represent things. And I was kind of learning, you know, the, the deal with the, the term insurance. So we're showing, uh, this, this, what I had taken from the illustration of what the cost of the insurance will be. Uh, each year. So, okay, I'm going to use this teaching point here about whole life insurance and term insurance. So on the left-hand side, the vertical axis, you have the cost, the annual cost of having that protection. Think of term insurance as car insurance or renting your house or maybe health insurance. You pay for it for a 12-month period of time. And at the end of that 12-month period of time, you made claims or you didn't make claims. Uh, maybe the price changes a little bit or something. And then the next year you do it again. And so you're buying protection for this chunk of time, this period of time. But I think you'd agree that if you pay your car insurance uh, or you uh, pay your health insurance or you rent your house, at the end of that period of time, you don't have anything to show for it, right? It's not a wealth building tool because there's no place in which you're building equity or building or saving cash inside this vehicle. And so term insurance actually came around about 50 or 60 years ago following the path of things like health insurance and car insurance. It started to become common that you could kind of rent protection uh, these different kinds of insurances, home insurance and that kind of stuff. 
And so in the early seven, late 60s, early 70s, this thing, term insurance started coming out. And again, think of it like car insurance. Like I pay for it this year. I didn't claim anything. Next year, I'm going to do it again. I hope I never have to claim on my, my life insurance. But when you're, and it's really just priced on the amount of risk. If you think of like 100,000 people, your same age, health, and gender that the insurance company is covering, like what is the percent likelihood that they're going to have to pay out your family this million dollars that you have coverage for? And then, and, and that's basically like how many people die at that age that are like you. Uh, and then, and so then they basically say, well, listen, we'll charge you a fraction of that so that when the two or three people die this year, that's your age, we'll pool together all those premiums, pay out those three death benefits and still have enough profit to be, you know, to be successful. So it's all just actuary guys in the background, R uh, you know, renting your life insurance is a really good plan for young individuals. So if you're in your twenties, and you've got a mortgage payment or you're still renting, trying to build up that money for the house. Um, you're a, maybe single income. Your, your wife uh, or spouse has, you know, the two kids that they're, they're taking care of. And you have decided that that's what you want to do in your life. And I commend that, you know, you want to have somebody stay home to take care of the young kids. And, and so you're single income. You're trying to save for the house. You don't have, you're like, you're not walking around everywhere going, man, this money is piling up on the floor. I need a bucket to save the money in, right? Like you're just not in that environment but the environment you are in is you need some protection. And so renting your house is a whole lot better than sleeping outside. But everybody from the very beginning of your financial journey in life has said the American dream is to buy your house, stop renting, stop wasting your money. And so you're back there trying to figure out a way, to build up enough cash to buy the house because everybody said you should do it. Renting your house is exactly the same thing as renting your life insurance. It's not a great wealth creation tool, except that it is protecting a really important thing in your family's life, which is your income, right? And so again, go back to renting the house because I want to make this continued parallel between real estate and life insurance. They're both wealth generating tools that if you look at generational wealthy families in America and abroad, they have life insurance and they have real estate or they're not wealthy for very long yet, or maybe they didn't learn any lessons, but they won't stay wealthy if they don't have those things in their family. So they're fundamentally the same asset. It's crazy that that um, Dave Ramsey loves real estate. Well, not as much as he loves the stocks that his advertisers you know, pay him to promote, but he likes real estate. He hates life insurance, whole life insurance, right? Um, it's just crazy because if you look at them fundamentally from a financial perspective, they're the same thing. They are, they are assets that provide protection, You know, a roof to sleep under in case a tornado or something comes by, like you guys aren't gonna get killed. Uh, and it improves quality of life substantially. So renting your residence uh, which many people do when they start out is 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 awesome. It's a lot better than sleeping outside. Um, uh, but it is not. There's no mechanism there to collect, protect, and grow cash, equity, or or cash, right? So think about life insurance the same way. Having protection on your sole income for that young family is vital. Um, the issue is that it, there is nothing in there. There's no mechanism there to. There's no bucket to collect the cash. When you pay the term insurance premium, it goes to the insurance company. You made a bet. It's really weird to say this, but you were betting that you were going to die that year. And the insurance company was betting you were not. They're willing to take the bet. At the end of the year, thankfully, the insurance company won. You lost. And they're like, hey, do you want to bet again? Right? I mean, that's really what, what term insurance is. It is not a bad thing. Again, I love it. I have a bunch of it on myself. Many of my clients have it on themselves. Uh, and let me explain just for a second why that is. And then I'm going to come back and talk about the two of these again real quick. Um, I, I'm going to fast forward to something else if I can pull this off. Um, all right. So let's give this a shot. Okay. So those of you that are able to see it, uh, and this is an easy one to explain. Um, everyone that we meet has to be on two parallel paths. The first path you see up there on the top is a protection path. And what I mean by that is protection from liability, disability, and death. And that's about the type of the amount and the positioning of that protection. So you have this protection path that you're on throughout your financial journey of your life. The second path right below it on this picture is the wealth accumulation path. They're parallel. And that's about capital. That's the one we think a lot about. That's about you know money that you need for short-term things like perhaps a new car, uh, intermediate type things like a, a rental property or paying off your residence. And then long-term things, certainly your own retirement or kids' college. And the reason that you have to be on both is the way in which wealth grows over time. You see that, um, you know, you can't just go and pay that first $15,000 into a 401k and suddenly it becomes a million dollars. Wouldn't that be awesome, right? It took time. 
you had to deposit money over time and get a return. And so what we say is that wealth accumulation is most effective later on. You see that exponential growth on the right-hand side. And you have to start it today, but in the effect, the big impact uh, of savings happens over time, happens later. And another important thing to realize is that you don't own this curve. You don't have the right to be on the curve throughout your lifetime. Um, there are all sorts of things that can interfere with the curve. And, you know, those things that will knock you off. And my clients say things like, yeah, I could lose my job, the economy, our rental property, somebody could steal my money. You know, there's all kinds of things they say. And so that's the reason why we protect first is so that we assure ourselves of the probability of having the curve materialize with certainty. So I'm not in the business about giving my clients a good shot. I'm in the business of making 100% certainty they're going to get to the goal that we set together they were going to get to. And if I'm going to do that, you know, if, if Honda is going to offer a, a guarantee on their automobiles, there has to be some conditions, right? They don't say, go do whatever you want to with it. And if it doesn't work, we'll replace it. Like, go take it to a car crusher. And when you bring back this little suitcase metal, we'll just give you a new one. Like that, there have to be requirements, right? And so whole life insurance have some things that rub some people wrong who are thinking about this as an investment. So we'll get into that. Like there's requirements, there's a minimum contribution, that kind of thing. Um, but protection is necessary. Going back to these two curves, it's necessary to assure the probability that that wealth curve, that big exponential green curve you're seeing is actually happening. And that's what all empirical evidence has shown us after tens of thousands of hours of thousands of clients. And if I could put all my clients in the room with you there today, uh, they would say that they would rather have a, a 100% probability of getting maybe just 95% of the way to their target than the possibility, the possibility of getting all the way to the end with the likelihood of falling far short. In fact, most Americans don't even get halfway. That's what we've learned, again, after hundreds of thousands of hours with thousands of clients over the years. And so I, that brings us back to that protection side. Let's talk about, you know, young families that are in their 25s or 35s, right? They may be in a position where they can start a small policy. They can say, yeah, I can save $1,000 a month. Um, you know, I've got everything else all stabilized. Maybe we're dual income still or something. Um, but maybe they're single income, high tech or a surgeon or whatever, and they have the capacity to do both. Well, then we would start off with a family bank, you know, go right to the point of buying your house. Like you're in a position where you can do that. But if you're not in that position, and most people aren't, and sometimes people in their 40s, 50s, and 60s aren't, um, but if, if they recognize the value of protecting those most important assets in their lives, and this thing I'm pointing to myself, and Randy should point at himself, and you should point at yourself there, listener, um, that's the most important asset you have in your lives. And I, I tell people right up front, I'm like, listen, I am interviewing to be a guide for you over your lifetime. I want to represent you and help you achieve your targets in life. But if you don't agree with me that you're the number one asset, if you feel like maybe that inheritance you got or the, you know, the 60s Ferrari in your garage is going to be the thing that's going to make you wealthy and not yourself, we're probably not a good fit. Um, that's why I say never retire. Um, go do what you want to do in life and stop the W-2. I think that's awesome. Uh, but don't tire. Don't, don't stop providing value to the world. Like go look at any other plant that did that and you'll see them as, well, we call them dead or dying, right? So anyway, tangent alert. Sorry about that. But okay, so <laughs> that is... That's the protection and wealth accumulation uh, path. So how do we get there? Well, the protection path, again, we might just start off with term insurance. So back to my 51-year-old uh, potential client who said, I'm going to live to 110, get me the policy. Well, I found out that no one will go into their 80s, but Mass Mutual will. Mass Mutual will get all the way to 89. Um, and so, but then when I plotted it out, I'm like, wow, that is crazy. So I called the representative. I'm like, at age 89... Uh, it's $507,000. And he's like, yeah, that's just the guaranteed worst case price. And I'm like, well, what's the typical, what's the likely price? And he's like, oh, probably 150. And I'm like, well, why 507? I mean, even 150, $150,000 premium for a million dollar policy. Like who in the world would pay that? Um, and he's like, well, you listen, you got to understand there's a decent likelihood that uh, people are going to be dying at age 89 because that's life expectancy for that guy. Um, and so if you and your twin brother went into the insurance company, and you said, hey, got our birthday hats on. Uh, statistically, we're supposed to die this year. We both won a million dollars of coverage. Well, the actuary is going to look at them and go, statistically, one of you guys is, we're going to pay a million dollars. 
So why don't we collect 507 from each of you and we'll pay one of you a million and we'll still make out, right? So like mathematically, it makes sense. But the problem is operationally, we dump the term insurance way before it gets to that point. So they've created these really financially successful things, again, for both the client and the insurance company, and that's called level premium coverage. And so term insurance, again, it is renting your stuff, like renting your house, no mechanism to grow cash inside. It's, it's clearly a transaction where you hand the risk to the insurance company and say, listen, I got a lot on my plate. I don't want to take on the stress, figure out how in the world my family is going to survive if we have no savings and I die and they lose this $100,000 a month of or a year of income, excuse me, I don't know how to solve that. So I'm going to push that risk off to you guys. Here's a check you handle, right? And for $500 or whatever, like they protect you for a million dollars in your 20s and you move on. Um, but there gets to a point where it starts to become statistically likely it's going to happen. Funny story. Here's why I have my $5 million of death benefit protection, because I've always wanted to have this large amount of, of permanent coverage to start the legacy for my family, like I'm going to do big things. But I wasn't even halfway there on the amount of death benefit that was in my whole life policies because these doggone buckets, like to get to the death benefit level I wanted, they were could they would eat me alive. The bucket was so big, there's no way I could fill it at the time. But I knew I was going to get there. So I go to a Naval Academy reunion and um, I, don't know, I was probably like 28 years in or something, 25 years, I don't know when it was. But um, and, and I'm walking around and first of all, these guys got really old and out of shape. Like, I don't know what the world happened to them. Because, you know, like everybody else, I'm still, you know, 25 in, in my mind, right? And I don't have any hair, so I can probably pull it off. <laughs> so, but then they're talking about, hey, did you hear about Sam, John, you know, Steve, like these, you know, these guys got cancer, this guy died, this guy. And I'm like, what in the world happened to these people? And, you know, my wife pulled me aside and she's like, you know, you're like, oh, you're 50. So, <laughs> so um, I came home and I'm like, listen, I want this to happen. And so I got this 10 year level premium life insurance policy that allows me to convert. It's called guaranteed convertible. And I, and I can convert it to whole life insurance in the future, even if, you know, I follow the path that those guys did. And, and I, and so anyway, term insurance comes in this level premium kind of thing early on, but then you kind of have to catch up to the curve, the actual statistics. And so it starts to get kind of steep out here in your 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. And so I went to this gentleman and I said, listen, um, I got good news and bad news. And, and I'm like, the bad news is, um, I don't think you want to have term. Well, the bad, real bad news is that I can't get you to age 110. I can get you to 90. And he said, okay, well, all right, let's go to 90. And he's like, what's the other bad news? I'm like, the other bad news is that I did the math and, uh, it's going to be, uh, somewhere in here, I did the math and, and it, you're not going to see this pretty, very well, but it's $4.4 .4 million. <laughs> worst, worst case, $4.4 .4 million to pay for this million dollar term insurance over your lifetime cumulative, right? Total. And, and he's like, that's ridiculous. And I'm like, yeah, no one has it out there because it's just, I mean, that's all, again, that's all worst case. It wouldn't quite be that bad, but it'd probably be $2 million. And, and, uh, and he's like, all right, so what's the good news? And I'm like, uh, I can't tell you that part because you said I couldn't say it. And, and he's like, well, what do you mean? I'm like, well, whole life insurance would only be $667,000 of, of uh, uh, sorry, $500,000 of contributions. And 667000 is what the cash would have grown to become. So it's actually negative cost. You can't really say that. I mean, it did cost money. There's a time value that's missing here. Um, but there's more in there than you contributed. And it's going to go all the way out to age 120. And he's like, ah, that's it. I don't want to talk about this. And, and he, no kidding, did hang up on me. <laughs> and, and so I sent afterwards, I'm like, I did all the work. I'll just send you the slides. Um, but it, when you look at these two, the red line in this picture is the whole life insurance. And you're looking at it and you're like, that just can't be true. Like, it looks like it's the same level as the other. And that's because the scale is so massive. And, but it is true for this 50 year old, um, $3,000 was his term insurance policy premium. Um, but his whole life insurance was like 13,000. Well, why is it $10,000 a year more on someone in their fifties? On someone in their twenties, it's like $2,000 more. But the reason is because the insurance company and in whole life insurance, like your mortgage for your house, let's go back to the parallel. You can rent your house and you ask somebody like, why didn't you, why aren't you buying your house? Well, because I don't have a down payment. Okay, here's a down payment. Now, why aren't you buying? Because I can't afford the mortgage payment. It's so much bigger than my rent payment. And why is it bigger? Because you are building equity. Like we gladly say, I'm going to, you know, let's say that I have a lease to own and I get to the end of the lease and I'm like, yes, I want to own it. And so I take what was a $2,000 monthly payment 
and I turn it into a four thousand dollar monthly payment, and I give the guy a big down payment. Why did I do that? Because I will gladly put money in a bucket that is going into my own pocket that will grow with tax advantage for the rest of my life. Well, I hate to break it to you, but family banking is gladly taking more money than you would have to pay for term insurance, putting it into a bucket that will grow with tax advantages for the rest of your life. What does that sound like? It's exactly like real estate. The difference is that real estate is less liquid. So I wouldn't put my emergency fund in my real estate. I disagree with people like Dave Ramsey, who says, you know, make extra payments, pay off your mortgage early because you're taking money voluntarily from a position, even if it's a savings account, you're taking money from a place where you have control over it. And you're putting it into a place where you don't have control anymore. Yeah, maybe the banker said today you can have a HELOC, but the economy changes, you lose your job. For some reason, the neighborhood value goes down. The, the uh, you, you know, you just housing recession. Like any number of things can cause you to not have access anymore. So uh, I covered a lot of things there. And um, you haven't just turned me off. You're still shaking your head. So I'll, I'll give you, I'll, I'll do a little pause here. But I just want to draw that really, really strong parallel between life insurance and real estate. And, and term insurance is renting your real estate and whole life insurance is buying your real estate. Okay on that point? Yes, for me. And I appreciate you going to, into that. Well, for me, because I've done the study, right? And that, but that's uh, why I wanted you to come back on yeah. and go into detail with that. So I appreciate that explanation. It's a, yeah. as I'm sitting here listening to you, I'm, I'm trying to think back to when I first discovered this for myself and it's been a decade or more. Mm -hmm. It's really a mindset shift, meaning yeah, it's it's different. And I said that at the very beginning of the episode here today. It's not their tools, they're yeah. their vehicles. Those are the kind of the terms that we're using. Uh, you're using the parallel with the real estate, uh, just understanding different terms, understanding different philosophies. Yeah. Like I said, it's really a mindset shift. Uh, as I've mentioned uh, before, and I mentioned even at the beginning of this episode with my father, he thought he was invincible. Like, like you said, he was six months away from retiring. My grandparents on, on his side, both had lived. My grandfather almost made it to 100. I think he was 96, 97 when he passed. And my grandmother was mid 80s. He didn't think my dad was going to be anywhere close to having an issue in his mid 60s. And then lo and behold, he, he gets that, you know, wake up call that, oh, by the way, you've only got six months to go. <laughs> by that time, it was too late, uh, yeah. unfortunately, for him and for us. I mean, obviously, losing him was was more important than having the, the benefits and all of that that we're talking about here today. But the point that I'm trying to make is that he didn't have that mindset shift that he needed to think in these ways, which is what I want to do on the podcast, bring yeah. guests like you back on and have these discussions. Even if it's a if we can wake up one person to realize that it's not too late or it's not even too early, maybe that's where we can pivot the conversation going next. Let's talk about yeah. somebody. So I've got a son, Riley, and you know, Riley, he's 20, yeah. he turns 27 here in a couple of days. Let's talk to maybe that individual that, like sure. you said, may or may not have the, let's just maybe even say it's a mindset issue, right? May or not believe that they can or should look into something like this because they are at that early stage, quote unquote, of life. I'm yeah. 50. Uh, I'm actually just getting started with this process. As I, like I said, I mentioned, I learned, I learned about it about 10 years ago, but I'm really starting to try to implement it now in my going into my fifties. But then you also mentioned as far as, you know, like I said, my dad was 65. If he would have even have taken some action in his early sixties, the whole situation would have been so much differently. So maybe let's yeah. chunk that apart and maybe sure. three different phases of, of, life, meaning yeah, from that yeah, early stage of uncertainty to just that mindset part of how you can really take this vehicle. And like I said, there's a bit, there's an immediate benefit, but then obviously that, that benefit long-term as well, uh, maybe yeah. help some folks maybe just, uh, recognize whether, the, where they are in their journey, um, and maybe help them take some different actions moving forward, which will get them obviously a, a different result that who knows where that could take them. Yeah, yeah. So, and I love that generation. Man, are they fired up? Uh, the stuff that has happened on college campuses um, to to talk about our freedoms, uh, the the level that they voted for freedom uh, recently is incredible. I I work with, um, you know, I'm working right now with a 24 year old. I have plenty of clients that are single in the first five years of their working career. They get it. They they're not listening to 
the propaganda out there that is pushing all the money towards the markets and, you know, and, and all of that stuff that we know not to be true because we had to experience it in person. They immediately get it. I'm not saying every kid does, but most of them are like, yeah, I'm not really interested. I don't, I don't want the 401k and the mixed basket of target date mutual funds and stuff like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to hold on to it. Um, and, and so it's, it's really inspiring to see that happen real quick before we get into that, to, to finish that conversation about the whole life insurance. So whole life insurance, again, it's 200 plus years old in America. It's a very simple thing where it's a bucket. And so that those guarantees are there, uh, we, we do commit to putting a minimum amount into it for several years in a row. It also helps us meet some tax, um, requirements, some IRS regulations. And if you meet those requirements of putting at least seven years worth in, for example, of the minimum, then, then you, you have kind of gotten your ticket to be able to treat it like life insurance, which from a tax perspective is very similar to like a very large Roth account. It's after tax money that goes in that will grow and you can use the profits without paying any tax on it. And then it passes on one day with no tax. And so it's very similar tax wise to a Roth account. It just doesn't have any of those restrictions. And for the 24 year old or O'Reilly at 27, he's not really interested in making a decision today that he can't change for 32 years uh, to get all the way out to 59 and a half, right? Um, and so the old school whole life insurance is super important to get the guarantees and the tax benefits. That gets you that, that wonderful Toyota, you know, uh, lifetime kind of guarantee that's on there. Uh, and it makes the IRS happy. So you can, you don't have to pay tax on the profits that grow inside it. Um, but it wasn't really, it wasn't geared initially to be really high access to the cash, you know, super liquid at the beginning. And it wasn't at all flexible. Like whatever you chose the premium to be is what you would do for the rest of the time that you had. And so that thing is necessary, but we definitely don't want it to be in uh, the largest portion of it. And so the IRS says how small we can make that main or what we call base whole life insurance policy. And so we make it as small as they let us make it. And you can get it down, like I show a third here, but you can actually get it down to like 10, 15%, especially for young individuals like Riley. Uh, and so, in, in, you know, let's say that, that Riley is saving $1,000 a month, $12,000 a year. All right. So if he did the picture on the left-hand side, all 12,000 would go into this thing and he would be locked into doing exactly 12,000 every year for the rest of time, which would be really hard to get over, especially at that age. Um, and then the second thing is like there would be very little liquidity to it in the first couple of years. They just they hold back this blue base portion for the first couple of years so that they can put it to work in the economy, make more on it than lending it to you so that they can dig their way out of their startup costs. There's basically two ways in which companies in the financial world make money. They either charge you up front for it, like a will and estate plan, or predominantly, they just partner alongside you. They're going to make 9% pay you seven, something like that. And they're going to keep a little bit of it so they don't have to charge you specifically for it. Um, and that's how insurance companies have always done it. They just, they partner alongside you. It takes them 12, 13 years to break even on a life insurance policy but they get a little bit of a head start by not giving you access to this stuff in the first couple of years. Just, just the base part though, for Riley's policy, it'd be like 10% of, of the contribution. And then all the rest of it goes into this green feature that I call the cash component. Paid up additions is its real name. Um, but that part is much more flexible. You can put it in, not put it in. Um, and when you do it, it actually adds to both the growing cash inside your personal bank and it actually makes that life insurance go up too. So now, now that I've kind of gotten through that concept that there's some important features that have to go on, there's a couple of IRS regulations we got to watch, and that's my job, not, not the client's job. Um, and actually, it's just not that hard. Um, software will help me, you know, keep everything good. But we optimize this thing to the penny to be as efficient as possible for the individual. And if we're building one to be a banking system, what that means is I couldn't put one more penny into it, into the cash, you know, liquid portion, uh, the green version or green portion without violating the IRS limits. So it's to the penny as, as efficient as I can make it. All right, and so let's go to Riley's case. So what is Riley looking for? Let's say he's not married. I, th I think he does have someone out there in his life, but we're gonna say he's a single young guy who doesn't, has not even date. Um, in fact, he's kind of turned off by the life insurance and death benefit. You know, he's asking questions like, how much am I paying for that death benefit protection? Cause like no one, I don't need a will. Like, I, you know, my parents are just gonna get everything, you know, whatever. I don't have anything anyway, right? So, um, you know, so the death benefit, like we're not focusing on that. So those two parallel paths, you could make the argument that, um, that the, you know, there's no need for the, the protection parallel path, but you ought to learn about it. And I still teach the young kids this because the moment that there is somebody that they want to leave stuff to, maybe it's their church, maybe the church, you know, I have a young gentleman who is 25 years old 
uh, and just inspiring young Christian. And he, um, he had his, like his sister as the beneficiary. And I think his mom was like half. And he called me and he said, Gary, can I leave this to the, the feeding children in Mexico charity that we're, they're a part of? He's like, I just want them to be the beneficiary. And when I get married, I'm just going to get another policy and my wife will be the beneficiary of that. But, but he was just really, you know, so anyway, my point is we all have something we care about. And, and so maybe the protection does matter. Like I intend over my lifetime to give a million dollars to this charity. Well, you know what? I can snap my fingers and make sure that happens. Buy a million dollar policy, make them the beneficiary, done. Uh, whether I make it or not, they're going to get them, right? And so y- you can do things like that. But let's just say Riley's case, no, no, um, uh, well, let's stick with my 25 year old. We'll stop using Riley. Uh, so my 25 year old isn't how many money he's not dating. Uh, and, and he's really focused on building this business right now. It's a, it's a one person kind of low drag business. So there's not any employees that are worried about it. Uh, and so, you know, he really didn't need the death benefit, but he was okay with it. And then, you know, it clicked for him and he wants to leave for the charity, which is pretty awesome. So I'm going to minimize the life insurance side of that for that person. And in fact, every client I meet with, I think about the wealth accumulation bucket, what safe, liquid, protected, you know, tax-free internal bucket can I create for you to grow your cash as efficiently as possible? And in the case of saving $1,000 a month, I'd create a policy that could handle $12,000 a year, or maybe 15 if they want a little extra room and they see a, a promotion coming. Um, but that means that the minimum on that thing is going to be like $1,000 a year or $100 a month, right? And so what, we, what I'm trying to paint as the visual image here for people who are listening to this is that it's a bucket, <laughs> but it's a bucket that that needs a minimum amount going in every year. And we're going to decide what that is. We want that minimum amount to be achievable, never something you'd be concerned about. Yet we also want it to be big enough that on the top end, it can handle, it's, it's big enough to be useful, right? If I'm showing you something that can do $1,000 a month and you're saving 200 grand a year, it's useless. Like you, I have a policy like that because back when I started, I needed one that size. And, and I still put money into it. It's a cute little policy, um, but it's a rounding error compared to what I want the policies to look like in the future. Um, and so fundamentally, the design is still there. We're still thinking about the protection and we're thinking about the, the family banking policy, but they're handled separately. Generally, when I'm, when I'm helping go through an analysis of somebody's financial situation and we realize we want to reposition where the emergency fund is, where the savings account is to someplace where it's more efficient, um, I have a, a system called uh, Currents, which is a really cool cash optimization system that I pay a monthly subscription to to be able to offer to my clients. It helps collect money and it keeps people from just unconsciously spending it. Um, and, and then we use that to fund the policy over time. And so we've, we've created this bucket that is the right size to catch whatever their life looks like today. Um, I have people in their 50s that are saving $1,000 a month. I have people in their 20s that are saving $1,000 a month. they would be the same bucket in that case. The challenge is that um, when, we, when we're done with the bucket to save money into, then we look at, well, we also want to have this conversation like, who in the family do we put the bucket on? Sometimes they have, you know, a lot of term insurance on themselves that already have a whole life or something like they're protected on them, but maybe we want to put it on the spouse or the kids, you know, so that they, it can be a college savings plan for the kids or something. Okay. So we've handled the person in their twenties. Um, but in the end, we still look at, we've got the bucket set where we have a great place to save and grow the cash. Um, do we have the right amount of life insurance? Is the protection path covered? And if it is moving on, if it's not add a little like convertible term, like I have on myself. And then a year or two down the road, when the income's higher, we'll just turn that into a bucket too. Okay, so that's the person in the 20s. Pausing real quick, and then I'll go into the others. No, that's great. So I just wanted to, and you painted visuals and all that, which is, uh, yeah, that's what I wanted to have happen. So I would love to then go into some folks that are more our age, right? Um, yeah. I yeah. know you're, you're mid-50s, and I, I just yeah, turned so 50 this year. That, so. Yeah, yeah. So, um you know, growth, income, and legacy phases is one of the things that we focus on at, at Paradigm Life, the company that I partner with. Um, so the growth phase, I would say, goes somewhere up into your 40s, maybe even your 50s. I mean, it depends on what your your longevity feels like, right? If you're doing something that is passionate, running your own small business, or you're CEO of a company and you just love it, uh, then maybe it stretches into your 60s and 70s. And I think that's awesome. Mine is going to stretch to my deathbed. Uh, I am going to be growing. My, my net worth is going to be going up and, and net worth is, you know, it's bragging rights that I never tell people what it is. Re- really what reason I want net worth to go up is because it's, it's confirmation that I have positive cash flow in my life, which leads to abundant mindset and, 
and uh, you know, you just you're you're inspired to get up and go every day. You're not clamped to the ticker running across the screen like so many baby boomers are today, hoping that they don't run out of uh, money before they run out of life. That is just a scary, um, scarcity minded way to live, right? We don't want to do that. So whatever growth phase looks like. So if you're in your 40s and 50s and you're doing the same thing that 20 year old was, then life actually looks the same. It's just a different scale, hopefully. Hopefully you're saving uh, $5,000 a month or $2,000 a month and not one, right? And $1,000 a month is actually would put you in the top 5% of all age groups in America, sadly. Mm. Um, but uh, certainly would in the 20s, like you'd be in the top 1% easily. Um, in your 50s, uh, if you're saving a thousand dollars a month, hopefully you've generated some wealth or you're just not planning to retire, right? Like we, we need to look at your economy because a thousand dollars a month won't keep up with inflation nowadays, um, as far as getting you set to retire. So it's probably a little bit bigger scale, but we're doing the exact same thing. I look at a holistic financial picture. I help them handle the leaks in the bucket. Uh, if they want help there, like they have large credit card debt, let's figure out a better way to, you know, to consolidate that. Um, let's figure out what exactly we are saving. Sometimes they don't know what they're saving. That's pretty common. Uh, and so I set up that current cash flow management system that I was just talking about. And it tells us, it becomes very clear how much you're saving. And if you don't like the number, change your expenses, change your income, uh, get to the number you like. Um, and and so anyway, let's say that we're at 5,000 a month that we're saving in our, in our 50s or 60s, whatever. You're still growing. You're still saving and compounding and getting ready for that future thing when you're you're thinking maybe I won't be able to save as much in the future or work. Uh, so the buckets may be different sizes. You may have multiple buckets. You may have it on all family members. That's a great tool for legacy. Um, you will hear you know people talk about the Rockefeller method. There's a a, a great uh, friend and mentor of mine who uh, Garrett Gunderson who wrote a book called What Would the Rockefellers Do. And in that book, he talks about John D. Rockefeller created these life insurance policies back before the end trusts and irrevocable trusts, legacy trusts, which are still in place five, six generations later. And he did that because the U.S., um, the IRS was coming along and the, the amendment was going to be passed where they started taxing everybody. And so he wanted to protect his family's legacy and tax free environment. And it was essentially lifetime trusts or, or legacy trusts and this life insurance stuff. And so he's putting life insurance policy on himself and his kids and his grandkids and whoever he could get policies on. And they have perpetuated that going forward. Uh, each generation will put policies on either their kids or their grandkids. I mean, when you have it really running well, it's the grandparents, those of us in our 50s and early 60s that are making the most money, have the most um, disposable income because we put our kids through college, but now we don't we're not paying that bill. Um, and so we're putting money on the grandkids. Plus, there's just this thing I've heard about grand grandparents, uh, <laughs> Randy, where you look in the eyes of this little thing. And you're like, that's it. I'll get rid of the RV, my car, my clothes. I'm going to give it to this thing. Right. Like, Absolutely. and so you're very uh, you've gotten to the point where you realize you're going to survive and you want to do the things you probably didn't do for your kids, which is, you know, that's definitely true for me. Anyway, uh, so it's not that much different. And every case I'm looking at how much how much capacity we have to put in these buckets uh, how much, and so therefore, how many buckets is that? And, and, you know, there's no limit to how many you can put on yourself. I have six of these on myself. Um, I could have 60 on myself. It's really about the amount of death benefit or life insurance that you have on each person. And that's really tied to your income and your wealth, your net worth, right? So, I mean, Elon Musk could put $100 million a year into life insurance and no one would bat an eye. Um, so not that much different. In our 40s and 50s. But we're thinking about this as this growth, make sure we grow to the number that we want to be at if we're being kind of conventional so that we can then flip a switch, stop producing and start living on and not running out. Right. And so that's kind of the income phase. When you get to the income phase, either your body tells you it's time to slow down or uh, or you're just kind of caught up in this mindset. I'm 60. What do you mean? I need to quit and take my social security at a young, too young of an age and, and you know, and like not spend all this down. And and so when you shift into that income phase, what is the life insurance useful for at that point? Dave Ramsey would say, get rid of it. Like you don't need it. That asset is put out to pasture, right? And, and I would ask people when they say that, like, do you have, is your house paid off? Oh yeah, I was listening to Dave. It was paid off last year before I retired. Okay, cool. Do you still have insurance on it? Well, of course I do. Why? Um, you don't need the house, um, you know, and, and, you know, and oh, by the way, my 60s Ferrari, you can tell what car, like uh, my 60s Ferrari is worth $5 million, you know, and um, I definitely don't have that, just disclaimer. Um, 
but I also have the Honda and the Honda never lets me down. So I don't really need the Ferrari. Like it's a waste of money to put insurance on the Ferrari. If it burns down in the garage, the house is gone, the garage, the car's gone, whatever. Um, I've got a, you know, a shack that out by the garage and we'll live in that and we'll drive the Honda. But people don't do that. They recognize the value of the asset and they keep insurance on it. Right. And so, uh, if <laughs> Henry Ford said this thing is if you think you can and you think you can't, you're right. So I would say that if you think that you bring value to people you interact with every day, you're right. If you think you bring no value, you're right. And you should cancel the life insurance because you're probably not bringing any value. Right. So I just, I disagree fundamentally with that level. So, uh, so then if you need to have life insurance, cause this asset provides value to your kids and grandkids and great grandkids and all the people you're going to write the books to someday, um, then what is the life insurance bucket actually doing? What is that banking system doing? Well, if you think about it as the foundational layer underneath everything, then what you realize is that I need to save cash in an emergency fund. I need to save money for my upcoming taxes. I need to save money for Christmas or what, you know, whatever I'm going to use cash for in the future. Where am I saving it? You realize this bucket still has value, right? And then it brings additional value. So here's something that might be a third rail for some people, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, you know, accessing the liquidity in your house is a really good idea. Um, you know, Tom Selleck is on there saying, you know, I've looked at the numbers, right? And I'm not trying to scam you, right? Well, they're using Tom Selleck because he's a pretty reputable guy and he's right. Like when you look at the numbers, taking a mortgage, a reverse mortgage out on your home in, when you're elderly makes a ton of sense. First of all, you think the kids want you to live in the house they grew up in. There's probably nothing they want less than to live in that old house that's got all these memories in it that their parents, now maybe they want to hold on to it for, anyway. Uh, but they're probably not going to go move in there the moment you're, you're done. Um, but we think they do want to, right? So, so if you get a reverse mortgage, now the bank offers them an option. They're like, listen, they owe this amount on the house and you can uh, pay us off or you can uh, let us just keep it and we'll give you, you know, what's left in it. So like there's an immediate transaction that's available by a reputable bank, right? So it's very simple in handling the estate if you did that. Um, but what if they want to pay it off? I was wrong. They actually do want the house. Where are they going to get the money? You had the life insurance policy that just paid them tax-free income that they can keep the money, let the bank have that silly house, or they can buy the bank the thing back from the bank. So you've been able to access the liquidity inside your house and a reverse mortgage that I will tell you that most seniors need to do, but won't do, because no matter how many times the kids say, it's okay, you can sell the house. And they're not saying like, we don't want this stupid thing. They're being nice. Um, but the, the person is like, I can't do that to you. I can't do that to you, you know? And so the life insurance policy allows you to do that. And you can think of a dozen other ways in which having a liquid source that has a payout death benefit in the future allows you to do something. Another very quick example, you got your stock account. Right. And you're like, I don't want to be so heavily invested in the stocks. What I really want, and everyone wants this when they get older, there's plenty of statistics that prove this. This is now the 70s and 80 year olds, right? They're, they're like, all I really want is a guarantee that the money is going to show up in my bank account or mailbox money. I just want to know, I want, I want guaranteed income. That's what I want. People with a pension will tell you, love that thing. Um, and people who are counting on the stock market are like, man, I'm nervous. So they want to take that stuff and put it in a position where it can be safer, but what they really want is guaranteed income. Well, that's called an immediate annuity or a pension. And the problem is when you get an immediate annuity, you are in its most pure form, which is going to pay you the most money. You're taking money that was in the markets and you're exchanging it. It's like you go to Costco with a briefcase of cash and you hand it to the Costco guy and he hands you this green machine that spits out checks for you every money for the rest of your life, no matter what. We love that. The problem is we're like, man, if I take that 500 grand and I die next year, my wife is out all that money. Unless, unless I also have built up over all these years from when I was 25, this life insurance policy that's going to dump another 500 grand into her hands, right? Then she can go get another one if she liked the green machine, or she can just spend that up to her. Then there's the legacy side. So the legacy side is about you think that you have learned enough and you have enough wisdom and you think enough of these little humans that followed behind you that you want to not only leave things inside them, but you want to leave things to them. Um, and the way you leave things inside them is you convince them to stick around long enough, around you long enough that they listen to you. They're not going to do it in their 20s. They're going to do it in their 30s and 40s, but they're also going to do it between ages of five and 10. So how do you create those environments where they will do it? Where you have resources, you have agency, you have resources, you have uh, money and time, 
and you're like, hey, we were thinking about going on a cruise to Africa. It takes two weeks. Do you all want to come with us? There's a catch. We're going to have lunch together every day and you all are going to listen to us, right? So, <laughs> so that's how you leave things inside them. And then how do you leave things to them? Well, wouldn't it be nice to do it in, a, in an asset that your kids and grandkids can't screw up because they didn't understand it? It's going to perpetuate after you've been uh, gone for many years and uh, it's going to protect itself from taxes and confiscation. And so that's when this whole legacy trust thing happens. And eventually, when you become like the Rockefellers, it's the life or it's the legacy trust that's purchasing the life insurance on the kids, grandkids, great grandkids, et cetera. Right. And so I think that is a truly important way to prevent three generations shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves. So I'll stop there. And we went into that that description of the shirt sleeve, the shirt sleeves in the last, last episode, time. right? Yeah, we yeah. did last time. Yeah. So love that, Gary. Um, mm -hmm. Let's get into the the cash value benefit. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Let's dig into that because, yes. Yeah. So, like, said that, so like far how, has been how do you, fantastic. You use it for, why is it there? Yeah. yeah. So I, I mentioned yeah. this to you before we hit record, uh, but when I first started to discover this and to realize that that this value, this bucket, as you've described it many times, you have access to that capital to invest in other things. It's yep. not just something that you collect in your bucket and you're waiting to someday benefit from. It's something that you can actually utilize relatively yeah. quickly. I'll let you give in the parameters as far as like what the specifics are for that. Um, but let's get into that portion of it as well. Cause I think that everything up through the description of the uh, benefits and then leaving yeah. the wealth and the legacy. But then this extra benefit that took me a little bit to yeah. comprehend. Yeah. But once you see it, it's it's one of those things. Like once you see it, you can't unsee it. And which then just accelerates the excitement for me to get something like this uh, started for myself and for my family. But then also like you're talking about for your generations, right? For my yeah. son, we've talked about Riley here today, but even my daughters as well. Do this for I themselves. Heard. Four, and I've got a grandson now, for Rowan, for whoever else comes along down the line. Yeah. But then to build that mindset, I mentioned that earlier. Um, it's just a different way of looking at everything. Uh, but this cash value benefit, and I'm going to let you describe it mm -hmm. in more detail, is super exciting. I get excited when I think about it. Uh, I know you, you've done it and used it in yeah. your own personal life. And you probably have some examples of folks that have used it in, in their lives as well. We talked about in the previous episode uh, about potentially investing in, in real estate as well. And you've said that at the very beginning, yeah. it's the insurance combined with the asset of a real, of a real estate portfolio is what generates that wealth. Yep. And this is a great vehicle to get um, involved Absolutely. in that as well. Yeah. So anyways, I'll shut up there as well. And yeah, I'll let you dive into that a little bit uh, for us to the cash value piece. Absolutely. So again, bigger pic the big picture view before I, I drill down. So it's a bucket that will grow cash at a high rate. So roughly five to five and a quarter percent today, annualized over your lifetime, net of taxes or cost of any insurance or anything. So if you think about like, if I could go to Chase Bank and I could get a private client high yield savings account, let's call it 8%. Uh, and then I had to pay my taxes. And if I'm in the 24 or 25% tax uh, range, then so my 8% will become 6%. And then I'm like, okay, but I have that protection and wealth accumulation path. So I got to go get the protection now because I use the savings account at Chase uh, to store my cash in. So maybe I lose a percent every year in paying for the term insurance. So this 5% vehicle, which provides the cash growth and the protection is like 8% or 9% at Chase Bank today. It's a tremendous growth uh, vehicle, but it's not an investment. It might outperform the markets and Dave's investments, but uh, that would be happenstance because what it is is a safe liquid guaranteed place where you're collecting, protecting, and growing. So because it is a place where they're collecting a little bit more than they would have to for term insurance, and they're saving that and they're growing it, it now is this vehicle that that is you know growing money over time. And then you can access it for any purpose. I'm showing this picture. One, one of my mentors in the industry uses this uh, this tank. This uh, uh, I forgot what he calls it now, sadly, but but it's this it's this uh, piping system, the plumbing system of life, your financial life. And he says, hey, you have this income and you have this lifetime capital potential. It's a big old thing, and the money flows through these pipes and it goes down the drain, and that's called lifestyle. And so sometimes all the money, all the water that comes in from our income goes down the drain, right? And then we're like, okay, hold on a minute. 
I'm not going to be doing this job for the rest of my entire life. What if there's, you know, I get hurt or, you know, any of those things that can kick us off the curve we talked about. Well, I need to, I need to shove some of this stuff up these whole, up into these holding tanks up here. And there's one holding tank called investments. Uh, and that's got the word risk written on it. And then you notice that there's no, no top on that tank. From time to time, the water can evaporate out of this tank. And it has in my life, I can show you what that feels like. Um, but then there's a tank over here called safe tank. And the safe tank could be your savings account, checking account today, but it could also be your whole life insurance. And it's got a lid on it. Like the, it is guaranteed never to go down in, in amount. And it's actually guaranteed to go up in amount every time, which is pretty cool. And, and again, exceeds the chase version. Um, and so there's money in here and, and some of that money needs to be an emergency fund, but then some of it you're saving up for opportunities. And so let's say that one of those opportunities is you want to shove a bunch of money in as a down payment into a house. And, um, and you know, what I thought I would have to do is take the money out of my savings account and put it into the house. I would take it from a liquid place and put it into an illiquid place. But what Randy, you've been explaining to people is that you don't actually take it out in this case. What you're physically doing is you're saying, hey, I am willing to pledge this as collateral. Leave it in here. Pledge it as collateral for money I'm going to borrow from the insurance company. Take it from their tank and put it into my other tank over here. So I actually bought this thing without any of my own money. I had a big old bank loan up there. And then I borrowed the down payment from the insurance company. Um, and my money sits over here in my tank and still grows. So when I was getting ready to do this, nuclear engineer, very analytical, I'm running Patrick Donahoe at Paradigm Life through his paces, you know, 15 years ago. And he's like, yeah, I, I can tell you're hung up on something. Like, what are you hung up on? I'm like, it's actually two things. I keep hearing on the internet that, or, you know, YouTube or whatever, that um, I, you can borrow out your own money and it's like, it's still there. They're still like, somehow you're playing a trick on the insurance company and they're still paying you on it as if it were still there. And I'm like, it just sounds like a scam. And he's like, well, that would be a scam. He's like, that is not what is happening. What is happening is that I simply pledged it as collateral. So he didn't use this analogy for me, but I got a bunch of real estate investors listening, I have no doubt. And so I'll use it again for you because I've been making these parallels with real estate. Well, today, if you have 100,000, uh, let's say you have $200,000 of equity in your primary residence, I think we may have touched on this before um, in, the, in the past episode, so I'll go brief. But if you have $200,000 of equity in your primary residence, you can get a HELOC. And that HELOC, they may say, we'll give you a access to 100 of the 200 that's available because we want a little protection yet, but we'll give you access to 100 of it. In these policies, they will give you access to 100%, no questions asked, because it has this long track record of going up in value every year, all right? And so they say on your house, hey, we'll give you access to 100 of the 200. So what can I do with that 100K? Anything I want. Why would they let me do anything I want with that 100K? Because they now have, you know, I have signed over access to my property to them. So if I don't pay them back, they get my house. But when they gave me the 100K, they didn't go like saw off the fourth bedroom and sell it at auction and, and give me the hundred from that, right? Like the house is still there. That sounds stupid. But yet we constantly say in our mind, I borrowed from myself. I borrowed it my own money out, right? And that's not what you're doing. What you're doing is a very important word called against. You're borrowing against your money, just like you borrowed against the equity in your house. And so does the house still go up in value? Do I still get to use it like I did before? Of course. So Getting a HELOC on your house is better than selling it and buying another one just to get the equity out of it, unless you wanted to move anyway, right? And so you can have your asset continue to go up in value while you access that value um, and, and it still continues to do its primary job. Same thing here. I can access the value of the life insurance cash value by borrowing against it instead of physically taking it out. I can physically take cash out. Um, but then it's gone forever. Um, and I've kind of interrupted all that compounding that could have occurred. Um, so that's, that's an example. Um, I have a visual, which I'm not sure is necessary, but, um, this is a visual of how I buy my real estate. I, I go get a, a big old, uh, bank loan over here. Um, and you know, but then they're going to make me still do a down payment. And so I go to the insurance company and I get a second loan from the insurance company and I'm physically borrowing out their money. Uh, and the reason that they would give me their money in what's called an unstructured loan, meaning I don't have to uh, fill out an application. I don't have to uh, tell them when I'm going to pay it back or even make monthly payments. The reason, again, is because they have my money at their facility in the policy as collateral. They don't care what I'm using it for, when I'm paying it back. You know, it's like, it's like Randy, you're going to go on 
you're going to go on vacation with a family to Tahiti and we're next door neighbors and you come running over and we've been friends forever. And you, and you say, Gary, man, we're getting ready to get on the airplane uh, or go to the airport. And I just realized I have $10,000 in gold in my safe and I just don't feel safe. Like I've seen your safe. Would you hold it in your safe? And you and I've done this back and forth. This isn't anything that's unusual. I'm like, sure, man, no problems. Stick it in the safe right there, right? And so we lock it up and you go off to Tahiti. And like a week later, you call me kind of in a panic again. You're like, man, it's going great, but I have this opportunity to buy this land in Tahiti and I need $10,000 down payment. Would you, would you wire me $10,000? And I forgot what I said the gold was worth, but let's say it was worth $20,000. Um, and, and I'm like, sure, man, I'll send it right over. Now you're, you get off the phone and you're like, why did he just do that? Like he didn't even ask me what it was for. I didn't even have to tell him about the land because I have your $20,000 in my house, right? And so that's exactly what this life insurance policy is like. It's there. This works. It's super simple. And the aha moment or the it sounds too good to be true, it really should be sounds too simple to be true um, because it is very simple. And it's stripped away all the bureaucracy, all the risks of uh, fractional reserve banking and all this stuff. It's just gone. It's just ethical individuals doing what they've been doing for 200 years, collect, protect, and grow cash. And when you die, whether it's tomorrow or 100 years from now, they pay your family. End of story. Love it. To me, it's control. <laughs> it's control. Yeah. Um, it's something it that I control. talk about a lot here on the podcast. It's what I'm trying to implement in my life, my personal life. I've been trying to encourage as many people as I possibly can out there. Uh, I think a lot of times the anxiety that folks feel is is lack of control. They don't have mm -hmm. any control over what's going on in their day-to-day -day activities from a financial standpoint, from a, a job or income standpoint. And it's, it's about the mindset shift. I, I want to go back to that. It's just a different mindset shift that when you, it's super simple. You said it just there, right there and you're right. It's, it is. And it's almost like we try to make it more difficult or more complex than it simply, than it really is. When yeah. I first heard it, I mean, I was mind blown. I could not believe what I was hearing. Like what you said, you were, you were peppering uh, uh, Patrick Donahoe with that, is those questions, yeah. as far as like, are you telling me and it's like, yes, it's true. And you've used it. Uh, I intend to do it for myself. I use the uh, HELOC option mm -hmm. um, to buy my rental properties. And that was something that uh, I was yep. learning how to do personally. And so let me just say that then too, folks, is you need to get yourself educated. Uh, right. You can't just willy-nilly do this and expect to have a positive result. You need to get yourself educated with terms, with people on your team. Uh, we've talked about that in episode in the past with Gary being on my team and, and an advisor and helping me make those decisions. Uh, you can find folks that can help you make these types of decisions and get yourself educated first, which is simply why we're having this conversation today. It's education. But when you get educated, you can then take ca collateral, use things as collateral, right? And that's what I used my house for, borrowed against it, bought investment properties, use those properties to pay back the loans. Anyways, I won't get into more detail than yeah. that, but I was doing that with a HELOC, which is exactly what you described, which is my intention then for these policies moving forward for myself. And that's why I'm encouraging them for my children as well. Um, and that's why I want to encourage that for you, the listeners too. If you found any interest in what we've discussed here today, uh, get a hold of Gary. It takes somebody that understands how to put these in place properly. Uh, as you mentioned, there's other folks that will say that it will do 10 different dozen different things. Right. Yeah. And I'm, and I'm not here to tell you that, that that's right or that's wrong. You'd be able to more able to tell me what's, what's correct or what's not correct. I like the simplicity, like you said, yeah. taking it from a Robert Kiyosaki standpoint and breaking it down in an eighth grade or eight, eight year old standpoint. That's what I love. Just keep it super simple, but I want it to be super effective that at the end of the day, there's guarantees that I will have a probability of a certain outcome that I can foresee today that uh, obviously in the future, I don't know exactly where that's going to go. So uh, you've got something pulled up here. Also, I, I assume you've got something here. Too. Oh yeah. It's very quick. I, I wanted to sure. show for those who could see visually, uh, just what an actual like illustration would look like. This is a Penn mutual um, life insurance policy. And, and I just want to show people like the access, the liquidity that is possible in each of these years. And it's actually a little better than this today, but this was a few years old and it's a 40 mid mid forties individual. And they were going to put a maximum of $40,000 a year in. So fairly aggressive. Um, this person, um, you know, was, was going to save that uh, for several years in a row. I'm showing like seven years going here. 
Um, and, and what you can see, if you're able to, to look on here, is that after the first month, you have access to about 70% of what you've put in. Today, it's maybe more like 80%, depending on the person's age and health, uh, but a access to a lot of the contribution uh, right away. Uh, and the next year, it's a little bit better and then a little bit better. And by the time you get to five or six years into it, you have access to as much or more than you've contributed. I mean, you go down far enough, 20 years into it, you've got twice as what you've contributed. And so this is just an example of somebody max contributing to a decent sized policy. Um, this would be somebody who wants to buy a rental property a year, for example. Um, and then this is just a little bit different view of it, but I just wanted to show that the minimum is generally about 20% of the maximum. So 40K max has about an 8K minimum. A 100K max would have a 20K minimum. A 10K max, maybe 2K minimum for Riley. So that's just an example and, and start to you know kind of understand um, you know what's going on. So I just wanted to, toss that in there at the end. And I said at the beginning, folks, you uh, check this out on video. That was a great visual. Uh, yeah. That would, uh, that kind of puts things in perspective as far as you can mm -hmm. see numbers, right? How they actually work. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that was fantastic. So I think we're going to start wrapping this one up here today. <laughs> Is there anything else uh, from this kind of standpoint uh, that you want to make sure I don't want to leave anything uncovered that you might have in mind, but is, uh, is there anything else to share with the folks here as we start to bring this one in for a close today? No, I just, I think you want to just kind of summarize for yourself really what this tool is doing. And, and if you go back to those two parallel paths, if you can remember that about life is that there's a, there, you need to protect number one asset, the human. And so it needs to be done in some manner. And I do love that Dave Ramsey tells people to buy some term insurance. Um, I think that's really good and he's, and he helps people save money and stuff. And so not all bad for sure. Uh, so protection is super important, but you can wrap that together in a, in the very best savings vehicle for your family. And I would make the distinction between a savings vehicle, which is safe, liquid and guaranteed money that you can always count on, uh, the difference between that and then an investment. Uh, I, I try to correct people every time I hear them say, I'm going to invest in a, and a family banking policy. Like it's not an investment, that's savings. Um, the, the rate at which it grows is pretty nice, uh, but it should be compared to savings accounts and checking accounts. Should not be compared to your real estate or your stock market asset. And because those things, you're willing to put money at risk of losing it to try to grow it faster. Clearly you would not put money for your grandchild's open heart surgery next month into the markets to get a bump on it. Actually, that's why we lost our property to tell a story. Um, our, the buyers, beautiful young family, um, and hopefully I haven't told your audience this yet, but the beautiful young family, I'm like 17 or 16 and, um, and they, they contract with us. We're boxing out like we're a few days from, uh, from, um, you know, closing and they come in tears while they had taken the down payment to purchase the property and stuck it in their stock market brokerage account. And the market just corrected like maybe 5% or something. And it was enough. They didn't have the down payment. The bank canceled the loan on them. Their dreams were crushed. And so would ours, right? And so that from a very young age reminded me, if it is something that's important, don't put it at risk of losing it. Uh, and, and so you're going to need this kind of an account. So that's what this thing does. It's a savings vehicle coupled with protection of the number one asset. I think that's, and we create the bucket to be the size to allow you to save the way you want to save today. We solve tomorrow's problems. Tomorrow. So that's big picture. Love it. I really do appreciate you jumping on. If folks are out there today and uh, we mentioned this at the, in the previous episode, but if they're like, okay, I need to get Gary uh, in contact with Gary, learn more from him. Uh, you've got your own podcast. Uh, make sure you mention mm -hmm. that as well. Uh, yeah. Where are the best places for people to get to know you even a little bit better, uh, potentially even jump on a phone call to see if that's of this bucket, this savings vehicle yeah. is something that they can start implementing themselves, whether they're 20 ish to, you know, who knows how old they are, right? That's the whole yeah. point is to, it, it, it's Absolutely. valuable for it, anybody. Yeah. Where are the best places for people to do that? Exactly. Exactly. Perfectly said. So um, I try to make it as simple as I could. So it's GaryPinkerton.com. On there, you'll find my podcast that's called Gary's Gulch, G-U-L-C-H. It, it's a uh, harken back to Ayn Rand. I think we talked about that in the last last episode, but I'm a big believer in Ayn Rand and her, her um, ideals about freedom. Uh, and in there, I talk about wealth strategy and these types of topics. I think you'd have a great time. I also talk about investments. Um, so Gary at GaryPinkerton.com. Just go to GaryPinkerton.com. You'll find uh, my podcast on any of the podcast players, Gary's Gulch. Love to have you on as a guest, Randy, you and, and anyone else who has something that they feel like they could 
uh, testimonial or some insights that they have. Uh, very open uh, format podcast. Thanks, Randy. Absolutely. I appreciate you coming back on. And uh, we're going to leave it up to you folks again. Uh, we received some feedback that was positive about the previous episode, and we would welcome and encourage you to leave us some feedback with this one as well. Let us know what you're learning, what the take, what the takeaways are, uh, maybe even some of the questions that you might still be having. I'm mm -hmm. trying to hit Gary with questions that I know that I was trying to learn and discover uh, when I was first uh, investing or uh, investigating this uh, type of vehicle for myself, for my family. And as I started to unpack things for myself, it's like, if, you know, you turn the page, you learn something new and you learn something new, uh, which is exactly exactly what we're doing here uh, here on the podcast. And so if you have any other okay. questions, uh, reach out to Gary directly. You can reach out to me as well. Uh, but we'll do what our best to try to help educate you even more if that's uh, something that you're interested in. Uh, Gary's mentioned about potentially coming back on again if if that's something of interest uh, to you. And I, it is for me. I just enjoy the conversations. Mm -hmm. uh, learning for myself how to implement these strategies into my life for my family, uh, for my friends. Um, and that's what I really want for you uh, moving forward. So make sure it's all about the mindset. It's all about control. Those are the big takeaways I want you to hear from me today. Gary went through a lot of detail as far as like how these things work. But from what I want you to hear from me is it, it's about control. If you have anxiety about your future, even about your present, I would venture to believe that it's because of lack of control. And if you start the process with the mindset shift and start learning some of these principles and some of these ideas, I promise you, you can re in a relatively short period of time, start taking back that control and then start being able to you know, play the game the way you want. Um, it starts to be a little, lot more fun. That's for sure. It has for me. And I would encourage you to do that for yourself moving forward. So Gary, man, I just appreciate your time. Uh, this has been fantastic and hopefully we'll get some more feedback and maybe we'll get you back on again. We'll see. Sounds, sounds awesome. I'm always ready. Thank fantastic. you all. So folks go out there, have a fantastic day. We appreciate you hanging out with us here almost an hour and a half, uh, mm -hmm. long episode today, but it's fantastic. Uh, if you've made it this far into the episode, greatly appreciate it. Share this with your family and friends. Anybody that you feel like could gain value from the message here today on the Rich Mind Podcast with Gary, uh, I would greatly appreciate that. Gary would as well. And uh, yeah, you, we can help people uh, really take back some of this control in their mindset moving forward. So go out there, have a fantastic day. I look forward to coming back with the next episode again very soon. Until then, bye now. Thank you for joining me on the Rich Mind Podcast. And remember, your external world is a reflection of what's going on inside of you. So focus every day on that internal battle and win within. Until next time, my friends.